हेलो फ्रेंड्स वेलकम टू ई पी जी पाठशाला आई एम डॉक्टर रविंद्र कुमार पाठक असिस्टेंट प्रोफेसर इन लॉ एट नेशनल यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ स्टडी एंड रिसर्च इन लॉ रांची द मॉड्यूल टूडे वी आर गोइंग टू डिस्कस इज सेंटेंसिंग पब्लिक ओपिनियन एंड मीडिया रिपोर्टिंग नाउ लेट एस लुक एट द लर्निंग आउटकम्स ऑफ दिस मॉड्यूल फर्स्ट इज टू अंडरस्टैंड द प्रोसेस ऑफ सेंटेंसिंग फ्रॉम द परस्पेक्टिव ऑफ मीडिया रिपोर्टिंग एंड पब्लिक ओपिनियन द सेकेंड इज टू अंडरस्टैंड द सेंटेंसिंग predicament the court faces the third is to understand the influence of uh, public opinion upon sentencing process and before we go into detail let's have the introduction to the topic sentencing is an essential aspect of administration of justice there are time honored norms and guiding principles that maneuver the judicial reasoning towards a just punishment the process of arriving at a particular sentence requires a judge to go through many a theoretical and factual guide post it is a complex process in the preceding decades the process has only become more complex with growing presence and influence of media moreover public opinion besides a uh, media trial one such factor that used to be looked into is to understand the relevance and importance how should court deal with public opinion that often seem to be exerting pressure upon adjudicatory process is one question that is required to be pondered upon more than ever before this question is important as there are no easy answer to the question this question is important in view of the fact that there is no legal obligation on a judge to feel bound or guided by public opinion there are scores of other questions that remain crucial to understanding the dynamics of sentencing against the backdrop of public opinion and media reporting therefore the intricacies and subtleties of sentencing in view of media trial and public opinion require a thorough understanding the present module will focus upon three distinct but intricately related issues of sentencing public opinion and media reporting now let us have uh, an exploration of the relationship that exists between the three concepts sentencing media reporting and public opinion are so intricately related to each other that the influencing impact they have on one another is instrumental in understanding the dynamics of justice administration system from the perspective of what goes on inside and outside the court in respect of a particular case before the court sentencing by courts influences public opinion in so many ways as regards the majesty and efficacy of law and media reporting plays a crucial role in molding the perception that public in general create that is media reporting is an is an is an influential factor in the making and unmaking of public opinion many a time the public opinion so influenced by media reporting apparently seems to have influenced the sentencing process as well media has become a 21st century peeping tom that guided by financial ends often crosses the limits both in terms of law and morals likewise the changing mores of the society infused with new sentimentalities and sensitivity have given a different color and content to the idea of public opinion which often seems to be lacking elements of reason and common sense the past fast paced life amid the din and clamor of modern life often leaves a scant space for appreciating the nuances and nitty gritty of sentencing there is a growing need to understand the modus operandi of how courts function especially in a situation where there is near total absence of sentencing guidelines and guiding and guiding principle precedents moreover sentencing is one such aspect of administration of justice which invites media and public attention in abundance when the court concerned is a high court or the supreme court though lower courts do play an important and foundational part in sustaining the administration of justice system now let us have a look at the sentencing predicament now sentencing forms an integral part of our social and uh, and legal existence it forms the core of administration of justice but is also a delicate and difficult task it matters how a court decides questions of sentencing within the broad confines and parameters of the constitution and the laws 
there are constitutional precepts that need to be followed along with the statutory provisions in a way that the process of sentencing conforms to these precepts and provisions and does not exceed the limit so let down. Unguided discretion plays a crucial role in sentencing process as Marvin Frankel says and I quote, the sentencing powers of the judge are in short so far unconfined that except for frequently monstrous maximum limits they are effectively subject to no law at all unquote. There is always a possibility of use of discretion getting misguided by factors extraneous to the facts of the case and the relevant laws. Therefore, if the court and judge does cross those limits, it is bound to give rise to chorus of discomfort rooted in unreasonableness, illegality and, uh, and constitutional impermissibility. Be that as it may, we do come across instances of sentencing that invites criticism and media attention which sometimes is based on reason and many a time upon unjustifiable reasons. Therefore, the role of courts and the way they hand out decisions are under the scrutiny of public opinion and under the spotlight of media. It however remains to be seen and debated how far judges are affected by such a scrutiny and a spotlight given the fact that courts are often faced with both moral and legal dilemma arising out of peculiar facts in a specific cases that, de that demand fidelity to law and demands of justice, which often is a demand for justice of power rather than power of justice. Such situations require judges not to waver from the commitment to legal text and constitutional principles. Now, we will discuss sentencing in India and about the absence of sentencing policies. In India, unlike other countries, there is near no sentencing policies to guide the way and the manner in which judges should award sentence. Supreme Court in Jasveer Kaur versus State of Punjab expressed disappointment and lamented that unfortunately, however, the question of sentencing does not receive due importance and the requisite application of mind by the courts. In our country, there is very little legislative, judicial or any other kind of guidance available to meaningfully deal with the question of sentencing. The absence of any guidelines makes the task of the court more difficult and casts a heavy responsibility on it to calibrate the due punishment that might be awarded to a convict, taking into consideration all the relevant facts and circumstances. It is however regrettable that the courts hardly give the question of sentencing as much attention and application of mind as it deserves. Now this aspect of Indian law has also been brought forth by Justice Sikri in Narinder Singh versus State of Punjab where he said that whereas in various countries sentencing guidelines are provided statutorily or otherwise which may guide judges for awarding a specific sentence, in India we do not have any such sentencing policies till date. The prevalence of such guidelines may not only aim at achieving consistencies in awarding senten sentences in different cases, such guidelines normally prescribe the sentencing policy as well, namely whether the purpose of awarding punishment in a particular case is more of a deterrence or retribution or rehabilitation etc. Justice Sikri in the Evop case also highlighted the fallouts of absence of a sentencing policy that often entails consequences of far reaching impact. The kind of predicament that engulfs judicial minds while deciding questions of punishment can be assessed from the fact that in US in a Senate report it was observed that federal judges disagree considerably about the purpose of sentencing, while one fourth of the, judge, of the judges thought rehabilitation was an extremely important goal of sentencing, 19 percent thought it was no more than slightly important. Conversely, about 25 percent thought just desert was a very important or extremely important purpose of sentencing while 45 percent thought it was only slightly important or not important at all. Justice Sikri while highlighting dilemma that judges often face in such a situation tries to come to a conclusion as what should be the acceptable approach to be adopted. 
in view of the emotional and moral and legal constraint, he observes that punishment whatever else may be must be fair and conducive to good, to good rather than to further evil. In, if in a particular case the court is of the opinion that the settlement between the parties would lead to more good, better relation between them, would prevent further occurrence of such encounters between the parties, it may hold settlements to be on a better pedestal and it is a delicate balance between the two conflicting interests which is to be achieved by the court after examining all the parameters and then deciding as to which course of action it should take in a particular case. Be that as it may, there is also an element of truism in the assertion that guidelines for sentencing are difficult to prescribe and more difficult to practice. In recent times, after a few decisions of the Supreme Court attracted media attention and public attention, a spate of questions have come forth regarding sentencing. However, there are, as Robert Frost would say, miles to go before there is in place a structured sentencing policy that would relieve the criminal justice system of the perils of indecisiveness and imperceptible subjectivity that many a time the discretion of judge seems to be under the influence of. The predicament continues, so does the repercussion. Now we will discuss public opinion, media attention and sentencing. Dicey described public opinion as a speculative views held by the mass of the people as to the alteration or improvement of their institutions. One such institution that concerns common man is court. It matters how judges decide cases. Judicial decisions after the rights of the parties concerned in a case as well as in set the precedent in numerous similar, sim, similar cases. Besides court especially in, in democratic setup are interested with, the guarding, with guarding the overarching principles of rule of law and that entails the absence of arbitrariness as well as protection of basic human rights of people that often are in danger of being violated if judges has to go through the terrain of unguided discretion as we see in cases of sentencing sometimes in a country like India which still awaits a structured sentencing policy. There are cases that evoke great public sentiments both prior and subsequent to the passing of decisions by courts imposing punishment on convicted person. There is a clamor sometimes that gets disproportionate attention because of the media coverage resulting into a situation that makes it very difficult to reasonably appreciate the merits of the case. Such a clamor is likely to affect the outcomes of the case if the judge succumbs to public outcry and media coverage. It however remains to be speculated how much media attention influenced the judicial reasoning leading to imposition of six year imprisonment if at all there was such an influence. The language of a speculation seems a, probable, a probability given the fact that there are instances where courts have seemingly been influenced by public opinion and media attention. They apparently seem to be under the constraints of public opinion which often is in the form of outcry and media coverage. In India, there are a number of cases that attracted ample media attention and touched public sentiments. Jessica Lal murder case, Priyadasni Mattu case, Nithari case and recently Delhi gang rape case are some of the glaring examples that have in recent memory generated a great deal of media coverage and aroused public sentiments molding public opinion regarding the criminal justice system in India. Hanging of Abjal Kuru stormed a debate as to the observation made by the Supreme Court while passing the sentence of death penalty. The court said that the gravity of the crime is something which cannot be described in words. The incident which resulted in happy casualties had shaken the entire nation and the collective conscience of the society will only be satisfied if the capital punishment is awarded to the offender. The challenge to the unity, integrity and sovereignty of India can only be compensated by giving the maximum punishment. The appellant who is a surrendered militant and who was bent upon repeating the acts of treason 
against the nation is a menace to the society and his life should become extinct. Accordingly, we uphold the death sentence." Unquote. The phrase used by the court in its judgment attracted rival arguments as to whether punishment can be awarded based upon the collective conscience of people, whether it is the body, the legal norms and the procedure that should be the deciding factor in, in, in sentencing process or should courts and judges succumb to the outpouring of public sentiments reflected in the form of public opinion. Likewise, very often media plays an influential role as regards the process of awarding punishment by judges and courts. Like in MP Lohia versus State of West Bengal, where the case before the court related to a dowry death, one article appeared in a magazine based upon the interviews done with the relatives of the deceased. The court observed that such types of articles appearing in the media would certainly interfere with the administration of justice. Moreover, it is now a fact accepted by the courts as well, as well that the media trials tend to influence judges by subconsciously creating a pressure. Now we will discuss do or should public opinion influence sentencing. Now as regards the question of public opinion influencing judges, there has emerged a set of rival opinions. Whereas one set of argument is that public opinion ought not to influence the sentencing decisions. Another set of arguments speeches for taking into account public opinion while making a sentencing decision. Now Justice Sinha takes the former stand while Justice Radhakrishnan takes the later position in their judicial pronouncement. Now, Justice Sinha in Santos Bariya versus the state of Maharashtra took the view that the courts cannot take note of what the general populace quote unquote favors as regards the question of deciding upon the sentence to be given. He observed that the constitution does not permit us to take a relook on the capital punishment policy and meet the society's cry for justice through this instrument." Unquote. Now, according to him, an inherent problem with the consideration of public opinion is its inarticulate state. He reminded of the Supreme Court's observation in Bachchan Singh where the court had said that judges are ill-equipped to capture public opinion. Justice Sinha made a telling observation when he said that capital punishment is one such field where the safeguards continuously take a strength from the constitution and on that end we are of the view that public opinion does not have any role to play. In fact, the case where there is overwhelming public opinion favoring death penalty would be an acid test of the constitutional propriety of capital sentencing process. He cautioned that public opinion may also run counter to rule of law and constitutionalism. We are also not oblivious to the dangers of capital sentencing becoming a spectacle in, in media. If media trial is a possibility, sentencing by media cannot be ruled out. Bhagalpur blinding case exemplifies the statement. Now, according to Andrew Asworth, whom Justice Sinha quotes in the judgment approvingly, he says that the views of sentencing held by people outside the criminal justice system, the general public will always be important even if they should not be determinative in court. Unfortunately, the concept of public opinion in relation to sentencing practices is often employed in superficial or simplistic way. In this sort article, we have identified two major difficulties with the use of the concept. First, the members of the public have insufficient knowledge of actual sentencing practices. Second, there is significant but much neglected distinction between people's sweeping impression of sentencing and their views in relation to particular cases of which they know the facts. Now, Justice Sinha concludes uh, observing that to construct sentencing policy on this flawed and partial notion of public opinion is irresponsible. Certainly, the argument is hard to resist that public confidence in the law must be maintained. It is also hard to resist the proposition that public confidence and sentencing is 
low and probably falling. However, since the causes of this lie not in sentencing practice, but in misinformation and misunderstanding and arguably in factors only distantly related to criminal justice, ratcheting up the sentencing tariff is hardly a rational way of regaining public confidence. Now, in, of the high, in one of the highly publicized Massachusetts homicide trial, Judge Hiller B. Jobwell made an oft-quoted statement that echoes the views expressed by Justice Sinha. He said that judges must follow their oaths and do their duty. Heedless of editorials, letters, telegrams, picketers, threats, panelists, talk shows. In this country, we do not administer justice by plebiscite. A judge, in short, is a public servant who must follow his conscience, whether or not the con whether or not he counters the manifest wishes of those he serves, whether or not his decisions seem a surrender to the prevalent demands. Be that as it may, there seem to be a growing acceptance of the fact that public opinion do and should influence sentencing. In Gurwell Singh versus State of Punjab, Justice Radha Krishnan took a contrary view and observed that the rarest of the rare cases depends on the perception of the society and not judge centric. That is, whether the society will approve the awarding of their sentence to certain types of crimes or not. While applying this test, the court has to look into the variety of factors like society's abhorrence, extreme indignation and antipathy to the certain types of crimes like rape and murder of minor girls, especially intellectually challenged minor girls, minor girls with physical disability, old and infirm women with those disabilities, etc. Examples are only illustrative and not exhaustive. Courts award that sentence because the situation demands due to constitutional compulsion reflected by the will of the people and is not judge centric. Now in Dhananjay Chatterjee versus State of West Bengal, the Supreme Court had observed that the measure of punishment in a given case must, de must depend upon the atrocity of the crime, the conduct of the criminal and the defenseless and unprotected state of the victim. Imposition of appropriate punishment is the manner in which the courts respond to the society's cry for justice against the criminals. Justice demands that courts should impose punishment be fitting the crime so that courts reflect public abhorrence of the crime. The courts must not only keep in view the rights of the criminal but also the rights of the victims of the crime and the society at large while considering imposition of appropriate punishment. A three judges bench of the Supreme Court in Ahmed Hussein Wali Muhammad Sayed versus a state of Gujarat observed that it is expected that the courts would operate the sentencing system so as to impose such sentence which reflects the conscience of the society and the sentencing process has to be stern where it should be." Unquote. Now we will discuss about the reporting and reporting of case and media trial. A large number of people tend to believe as correct that which appears in the print or electronic media. For these reasons alone, the mass media has to be circumspect while dealing with the news. Moreover, it is not worthy of fact that any item of news telecast in channel would reach persons of all categories, irrespective of age, literacy and their capacity to understand or withstand. The impact of such a telecast on the society is phenomenal. Unfortunately, this uncontrolled or unedited telecast or propagation of news is resorted to in the name of exercise of right to freedom of speech and expression or freedom of press and media trial has become order of the day. It is and has been rightly said that such trials and investigative journalism and publicity of premature half-backed or even presumptive facets of investigation either by the media itself or at the instance of investigating agencies has almost become a daily occurrence whether by electronic media, radio or press. They chase 
some wrongdoer published materials about him little realizing the peril it may cause as it involves substantial risk to the fairness of the trial. Unfortunately, we are getting used to it. As Stuart Parry points out, trial by newspaper or media has always been recognized by sound thinkers as pernicious, uh, yet we are still afflicted and in an increasing degree with an evil that has been an object of continual protest and warning for a century. It is a disease that does not cure itself. For a hundred years it has continued changing the manners and methods but unchanging in its effects upon the administration of justice." Unquote. Now, Perry laments that the trial itself is treated like a great sporting event. Media trial is a disease that does not cure itself." Unquote. Now, it is an accepted fact that the independence of judiciary is one of the cardinal principles of jurisprudence. The independence connotes non-interference from other state organs in the function of the courts as is evident from the constitutional and, and statutory scheme prevalent in India. However, independence of court also means non-interference from those quarters of society that may have an influential impact upon the judicial outcome and judicial process. One such interfering quarter may be located in media houses that run 24-7 news channels which more than delivering news to viewers impose their views often sensationalizing the content in a way that entire incident gets an altogether new color. Therefore, as Perry says, the independence of courts is one of the canons of our political faith. All agree that courts procedure should be free from all extra legal influences the practice that prevails in a large part of the state courts, especially in criminal matters, is the very negation of such ideals. Influences which are all in their final analysis, political influences, impinge upon the entire process of law enforcement and upon everyone connected de therewith. Now, in the state of Maharashtra versus Rajendra J. Gandhi, Supreme Court observed that a trial by press, electronic media or public agitation is the very antithesis of rule of law. It should be discouraged as such, it strikes at the very purpose of criminal justice system, jeopardizing the rights of the litigants. In Sahara India Real Estate Corporation Limited versus Securities and Exchange Boards of India, Justice Kapadia had observed that the constitutional protection in Article 21, which protects rights of the person for a fair trial, is in law a valid restriction operating on the right to free speech under Article 19.1a, by virtue, of, by virtue of force of it being a constitutional provision, given that the, con that the postponement orders curtail the freedom of expression of third parties, such orders have to be passed only in cases in which there is real and substantial risk or prejudice to fairness of the trial or to the proper administration of justice, which in the words of Justice Cardozo is the end and purpose of all laws. Supreme Court has time and again reiterated that those who are at the helms of the media house should ensure that trial by media does not hamper fair investigation by the investigating agencies and more importantly does not prejudice the right of defense of the accused in any manner whatsoever. It will amount to travesty of justice if either of these causes impediments in the accepted judicious and fair investigation and trial. There is danger of risk, serious risk of prejudice if media exercises an unrestricted and unregulated freedom such that it publishes photographs of the suspects or the accused before the identification parades are constituted, or if the media publishes statements which outrightly hold the suspect or the accused guilty even before such an order has been passed by the court. Now, the court observed in Manu Sarma versus NCT of Delhi. Now, we follow to what others have said. The court held in this case that it is not only desirable but imperative that electronic and news media should also play a positive role in presenting 
to general public as to what actually transpires during the course of hearing and it should not be published in such a manner so as to get unnecessary publicity for its own paper or new channel. Such a tendency which is indeed growing fast should be stopped. Now we come to the conclusion of the module. Sentencing essentially is a function to be performed by the courts based upon nature of guilt and guiding philosophy of sentencing. At times extraneous forces in the form of media reporting or public sentiments do threaten to affect the sentencing. Caution should be the guiding light for the courts and the media. They need to adhere to the norms that define their power as well as responsibility. Courts should try to be indifferent to pressure exerted by the media to influence the outcome of a case. At the same time, media which plays a pivotal role in making and unmaking of public opinion is required to bring to fore the truth responsibly and sensibly. In a democracy, both the courts and media occupy an important space in the realm of public opinion. Therefore, if neither of the two can afford to shirk the responsibilities entrusted to them, both in moral and legal sense. However, it cannot be denied that a trial by press, electronic media or public agitation is the very antithesis of the rule of law. Now, thank you uh, very much for watching the video.